Hey, everybody. Welcome back. As you know, we're on a mission to help people with chronic fatigue, long COVID, and MCAS resolve, find, and fix their real root causes so they can live the life they deserve. And I'm super excited about today's episode because we're talking with my good friend, Dr. Sam Shea, all about mitochondrial testing. So if you've been curious about what the mitochondria is and how to test for it and how it plays a role in your energy, stay tuned. So let's learn a little bit about Dr. Shea. So Dr. Sham Shea, chiropractor and IFMCP certified, solves health puzzles for busy health conscious moms, entrepreneurs, and those on the spectrum so they can exit survival mode and enter community. I love that. Dr. Shea walks his own health journey, walked his own health journey from being chronically unwell from age six to 18, including severe fatigue, anxiety, digestive problems, chronic pain, severe insomnia, and poor nutrition, which led to social isol isolation, which then further compounded his health issues. He took control of his health starting as a teenager and dedicated his life to natural medicine, functional testing, and re-entering community. Dr. Shea is also a stand-up comic, he's very funny, you should check him out, who uses comedy as edutainment on his YouTube channel, along with his other functional testing techniques. Dr. Sam, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks. It's really good to see you, Evan. And I I just, it's, how, how do you, because I just know you as Evan, like we all have all our degrees and stuff. Like, how do we, how do we talk to each other here? You know, it's... <laughs> It's like semi-formal circumstances here on these podcasts, so. <laughs> it is indeed. Well, I want to give you your due, and I appreciate all the uh, expertise that you have. I respond, yes. to hey, I respond to hey you as well. So Hey it's... you, yes. <laughs> My friend Sam, yes. Sam, I am. So let's start off first. We're going to be talking here about the mitochondria, but give us like a little bit of a picture of how you got into functional medicine and mitochondria and mitochondrial testing. Sure, like like the fellow super nerd uh, that that I am, uh, I I have I have pictures and a PowerPoint, and so we're we're gonna mm -hmm. go full we're gonna go full apex nerd here, and so my uh my my history is uh it was pretty fraught. Uh, I I grew up in a in a community that um set, spoused one thing but did another. And so there was a lot of gaslighting, a lot of, uh, I mean, bullying is a very light term. I, I mean, I, the, the difference between, I think the difference between physical bullying and physical assault is that if you're uh, over, if you're under 18 and still in school and you're hit, that's called bullying. But if you're over 18 and out of school, it's called assault. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the only distinction I could come up with because otherwise I don't understand the real difference. And right. So I had a lot of gaslighting at home and a lot of uh, emotional uh, uh, emotional abuse at home, uh, a lot of neglect, uh, even though I was in a very gilded, uh, I was a very gilded environment with a lot of good educational opportunities. It was not uh, emotionally safe and, and school wasn't physically safe, uh, despite the veneer of the community I was in. And I developed a video game addiction and sugar addiction, and I had chronic joint pain from the injuries I sustained from the violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had two parents that were both psychiatrists that wanted to medicate me into submission. And uh, they were not interested in dealing with what the actual problems were. And so I, and a father who was de facto absentee, even though he was legally ticking the boxes of the divorce agreement. And the, I just made a decision when I was in high school that I have to take control of my own health because I had bowel problems, crippling fatigue. I had insomnia mm. so bad between the ages of six and 18 that it literally stunted my growth. According to the, my hand size, my foot size, my father's height and the growth charts, I should be at least four to six inches taller and um, did not have a good diet. And all just, just other, just, just all sorts of problems were just compounding together. So I made the decision to um, uh, take control of my own health and uh, that led me down a very long circuitous road uh, that led me to doctor in chiropractic. I also got an acupuncture degree. I was a functional neurologist, a diplomat in functional neurology for about eight years before I went, uh, before I left physical practice and now do 100% virtual uh, uh, telecoaching for uh, 
uh, functional nutrition. And it's hard to do neurology through Zoom. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and then I studied uh, with the Kalish Institute for Functional Medicine and the Institute for Functional Medicine as well. And that's been my primary focus. And I've been doing lab testing now for, oh, I think almost 10 years. Like, And um, the mitochondria has a very special place uh, because I'd suffered with, with crippling fatigue. Uh, I remember lying to my um, grade school teachers that I felt sick in the afternoons because I just felt so tired. I need to go to the nurse's office to lay down. And uh, I would just literally just go to the nurse's office and just nap because I just couldn't keep my eyes open uh, in grade school. And, uh, but I couldn't, I, I couldn't say I feel sleepy because then I would get chastised and humiliated by my classmate and the teacher. So I had to say, I feel sick, mm -hmm. which I did feel unwell because clearly everyone else, it wasn't exactly a lie. It was more like I had to say it in a way that they could understand it, which was, I'm not right compared to everyone else. There's something wrong. I need to go to the nurse's office and that seems to be the only way to do it. So, um, yeah, it just, it came down to a choice and I, and then I went through, I went I got involved in mitochondria because of my training with Dr. Kalish. And uh, I learned uh, so much about um, how the mitochondria itself is kind of at the core of, you can kind of draw a straight line back to the mitochondria with anything that people are struggling with chronically in most cases, not all, but most. And I found that mitochondria was effective for working on mitochondria and other organ systems that surround it in general help people who are chronically unwell, people that are feeling normal and just want to stay where they're at. And also for the optimal performance, aspirational biohackers, entrepreneurs, high performance, longevity enthusiasts. And, and they, they just get all super excited when you mention mitochondria uh, and for good reasons. And the, the thing is, is that when people are wanting to assess mitochondria, uh, they have to look at lifestyle and they have to look at um, labs and both. And, and I'm, what I want to cover today is the, the labs in much more detail. So people have a better understanding of what they're looking at. And just to double back to what mitochondria are, and this is the way that I define it to the people that I work with. I say that mitochondria, this is a picture of a mitochondria up here in the top, right? It, it looks like uh, a, a weird shaped jelly bean, at least in this picture uh, that when you cut open, it's got this like twists and turns in it and, and the little rings or the little uh the the the, the genetic the, the unique genetic ring that the mitochondria had Gen the mitochondria have their own unique genetics and basically what happened is that there was a deal struck a way way back um in evolutionary biology that you've got these little uh, uh what was the fancy word it was like symbiotic prokaryos eukaryos i can't remember the exact word but basically, you have this one organism that's really good at converting protein, fat, and carbs into electricity or an ETP. And then you've got this bigger cell, this, this uh, eukaryote this, that has a bigger nucleus that needs a lot of electricity to run the joint. And so the deal is this little more, a more organism that's really good at just like making the electricity – you will live inside this organism and in exchange, we will feed you all you want in exchange for the electricity you, you blast off. That's it. That's the deal. So there's a symbiosis and, and it helps with the analogy. So if you imagine a human cell is just a, a city, like a microcosmic city, and you've got um, like the library, the big library, which is like the, the, the nucleus that has all the material of how to build, it has all the instructions of how to build things. You've got, um, you've got all sorts of construction going all around. You've got waste management, you've got nutrient shuttling in and out, and then you've got this electricity factory and that's the mitochondria. Now, if you imagine if a major city lost its electricity, it'd be about three days without electricity before it turns into Mad Max. You've, you've got, and then you got a rice running on candles and, and batteries. Uh, and until, until like there's things go to full mayhem and the, the mitochondria is, it is best thought of as an electricity factory, very fragile, 
a very um, efficient, very clean uh, and, and delicate electricity factory. And you want the, the, if you don't have it, what happens is you can't generate the electricity to run the city. And if, uh, so to give some real numbers to this, a mitochondria will take, say, glucose, just a molecule of sugar, and it will convert that glucose into 36 units of ATP or energy. So just keep that number 36. And with no smoke, no lactic acid. No, and lactic acid is that molecule that when you work out really hard and fast, you get that burning sensation in your muscle. Now, if the mitochondria is not working properly, then you burn that same glucose in in, you burn that same fuel in the streets, not in the factory. And the streets in this case is called the cytoplasm or the surrounding fluid matrix that's still within this, this in the cell, within the city boundaries, but is outside the mitochondria, is outside the factory. So if you burn that same molecule of fuel in the streets, it's like burning a candle. You get a tiny bit of energy and a tiny, and a tiny bit of smoke. But if you imagine you get like hundreds and thousands of people all out there with a candle, you're going to get like some light to kind of navigate by, but you're going to get some of this big smoke buildup. So instead of 36 units of energy, 30, you get two units of energy and two units of smoke, lactic acid. So what happens is the mitochondria breaks down. Then what you have are, uh, you, you have this rapid burning of fuel, of sugar, because you've got to make up for the deficit of two units of energy per sugar up to you know, 36. So you've got to burn a lot. And then you got all the smoke you're generating. So one way to think of things like fibromyalgia So one way to one way to think about fibromyalgia, it's the chronic buildup of lactic acid from this failure of mitochondria. So you're building up all this lactic acid in the streets. So you have this chronic achy muscle pain with nothing to show for it. There was no exercise that got you there. There was no high intensity interval training. You're just in this chronic achy muscle pain because you have this this buildup of smoke of lactic acid from this inefficient fuel burning from uh from burning the 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 fuel in the street. now this is that burning the fuel in the streets now this is called anaerobic glycolysis for the for the nerds out there that means anaerobic without oxygen because the the mitochondria takes fuel plus oxygen and burns it to make electricity hence called aerobic respiration uh, aerobic glycolysis aerobic i mean we using oxygen to burn sugar, glycolysis, splitting sugar. So, and then you've got, so that's fibromyalgia. Then you've got chronic fatigue. Well, if you're getting only two units of energy instead of 36, you're getting one 18th the amount of energy and you're just burning through it and you're just getting more and more tired because it's less efficient. And by the way, you burn through a bunch of your B vitamins through this uh, anaerobic glycolysis in the streets. So you're burning through your B vitamins, you're, 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 you're creating fatigue and then if you burn up your B vitamins, then it's harder to convert, say, you know, tryptophan into serotonin, which affects mood. And then you got the, maybe you need B vitamins to convert serotonin into melatonin. So it's harder to sleep. And this is where you get this constellation of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, insomnia, depression, uh, kind of as a cluster. And you can draw, you, you have, it, it's a very logical line. You can draw straight back to mitochondrial dysfunction. So with mitochondria, how when you're testing it, it's to understand the testing. It's really great to, to understand the mechanisms behind it. So the mitochondria is this factory, and it burns three fuels: proteins, fats, carbs. These fuels are delivered to the mitochondria through three separate truckers' unions. Okay, so you've got the fatty acid truckers' union, and they're all paid in different currencies. Okay. So the fatty acid truckers unit is paid in B2 and carnitine and the really long haul trucks are, are in glycine and some magnesium slipped in here and there, you know? So you've got this different, you've, you've got the fatty acid truckers union, they're paid the way they're paid. Then you've got the uh, carb truckers union, they're paid in uh, mostly B vitamins, uh, lipoic acid, uh, a couple minerals, you know, like they're, they're paid in some other stuff. And then the amino acid truckers union, they're paid in B, but B, B, B is mostly B6. So you can see how nutritional deficiencies 
can then stop the delivery of fuel to the mitochondria. So for example, if you someone is low in carnitine or B2 or, or glycine, and they're, they're not delivering fat to the mitochondria. So people who are struggling with, with getting rid of fat off their bodies, they may have an issue with the, the truckers union. Uh, they may have, uh, they're just, or they're more tired because they, they're losing a third of their fuel options to go into the mitochondria. Then the, the mitochondria themselves has walls, like it's a factory. So those are specialized lipids, like sphingolipids and other things. So you've got to have the walls of nice integrity. You've got machines in the mitochondria that like move, you know, fuel A into burn B, like they actually are doing the things. We call those machines vitamins. Each machine has its own mineral computer chip. The, the computer chips are minerals. And so you see how heavy metals can screw up the machines because you're putting a, a a really bad computer chip into a machine. It's like you're trying to run, you know, a, a 2023 MacBook Pro off of an, a 1997, you know, Mac chip. And, and it's just, it's not, it's going to be very slow if operable at all. Then you've got janitors that run around that are trying to put out the sparks from, you know, burning fuel all the time. Those sparks are called free radicals and 95% of all the free radicals in the body are generated inside the mitochondria. So you've got these sparks flying everywhere. So you need these janitors that are free radical enzymes that put out the sparks. And you've got three main janitors. You've got MN Sod, he's the head janitor. And then you got glutathione peroxidase and catalyze. MN Sod, I call Mr. Sod, you know, MN for manganese, but I just said Mr. Sod, he's the head janitor. And, and he's really important because if the head janitor is slow, then the other two subordinate janitors can't do their job as well. So, so like there's a hierarchy, even of free radical scavenging. So you got to make sure Mr. Sod is happy. And so there's certain nutrients called S SOD inducers that help promote the expression of, you know, get Mr. Sod going and people can have genetic variations where uh, the, their janitors or the, their head janitor is slower than the others. Uh, then you've got uh, issues with toxins and pollutants gumming up the machines, gumming up like like tarring over the whole the the whole endeavor. So this is why toxins and pollutants are problems. We already talked about how heavy metals can screw things up. You also can have viruses take over the whole thing. You know, this is like World War II, where you know Russia comes into Germany and just takes a factory brick by brick and just labels it and sends it back. And we're just going to take this over. Thank you very much. And this is where you've got um, uh, the viral takeover. And so they're manufacturing. They're, they're just hijacking the whole thing. And then you've also got the mitochondria are affected by uh, signals from the outside. Like the like cities are were, are part of a unit of a nation or a state. So when you had the the bombers flying over um, England in World War II from Germany, uh, the 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 UK just said kill all the lights, shut everything down, so they can't see where to drop the bombs. So you have mitochondria being affected by things like cortisol and stress hormones and specific neurotransmitters that that change how your if you're getting a warning signal from the outside, hey, we're under emergency right now. You need to shut down the mitochondria. But one of the, this is important. Mitochondria they're super efficient, super clean, but they're slow compared to burning garbage in the streets and lighting candles. They're slow. So if you're in an emergency and you need to mobilize energy quickly, um, it's faster just to burn garbage in the street. Just so you burn all the glucose quickly. You can burn a hundred times. You can burn one molecule of sugar. I think it's like a hundred times faster or something in the streets than you can in the mitochondria. If you do the mathematics, you burn a hundred units of sugar that's 200 units of energy versus 36. But the difference is you get tons of smoke uh, if you burn a whole bunch quickly versus no smoke, but it's 36 units over here. So if you're if you're under stress, your mitochondria just shuts down. Now there's mechanisms behind that where um, you got to also look at thyroid because the thyroid itself is the business the is is the signal to the, the mitochondria is the business end of the thyroid. And people talk about thyroid as like, oh my God, like it's basal metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate. Like no one's defined this. It's just like, oh, it's the amount of energy you produce. Okay. Well, what is it? It's the basal metabolic rate is how much proteins, fats, and carbs you burn in the mitochondria. 
So what happens is that thyroid makes, again, I love these analogies. So thyroid releases T4. It's this little four wheel car that goes, you know, meet, meet, goes down, you know, through the bloodstream, pulls over into the factory. And then it does this like transformer noise burp, 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 and like opens one door. And it's now the T4 has become T3, you know, and the T3 transformer thyroid robot is the engineer to turn up the dial and flip the switch to turn on the mitochondria. So some this is important because some people can have bunch of signs of hypothyroidism, like low, like like the, the brittle hair, the thinning hair, the thinning eyebrows, the fatigue, the global weight gain, the tired the whole day, as opposed to the sinusoids of up and down, um, just the 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 ambient level joint pain. There's there's you can, you can look up listicles of signs of low thyroid. And they go to an endocrinologist or to a GP or MD and they get tested and their thyroid is air quotes normal. Now, one, you and I both know there's a difference between medical normals and functional optimals. There's a difference. Like, the, the, we're, you know, Western medicine operates on bell curve biochemistry where they just have this massive range. And if you're within the, the range, it's normal, even though you may feel terrible. Whereas functional medicine is we're looking at optimals, which is a much tighter range. And then it's this, and it's this gray space between the optimal range and the medical range to outside that is pathology where most people struggle because they're told they're basically gaslit, even though, you know, I come from a family of medical doctors. They're not trying to gaslit you. They're just like, this is their training. Like if they're within the quote normal, you're, you're fine. What are you worried about? Right. You're quote normal. And it's, but they're not, they don't feel well. So what happens is that with thyroid, you can have quote normal thyroid, even within optimal level thyroid, but you still have the signs of low, of low thyroid because it's the mitochondria is busted, not the thyroid. So the engineer can just like button mash all at once and like spin the dials as much as they can. And nothing's going to work because it's the factory that's busted, not the control switch. So uh, that you can see how the mitochondria like interconnect. You talked about like adrenal stress and thyroid, and we haven't even gotten into gut health and and oxygen transportation and iron and all the rest of it. But you, the the if you think about the mitochondria as a factory inside a city, then then the analogy is near perfect. It's near perfect, complete with truckers unions. Like it's near perfect. So if we understand that, then testing becomes way less overwhelming to understand conceptually. And we're going to go over testing. And I just want to warn people, unless you're a Scrabble enthusiast or, or, or a clinician, like these, you will be just like, oh my God, what is this polysyllabic hellscape you're dragging me through? There's just, there's just all these really long, bizarre words that make no make no intuitive sense when you read the names of them like venyl mandalate sure that makes total sense just phonetically sounding that out or methylmalonate of course that relates to b12 metabolism you didn't know it's 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 this bizarre jaunt through very strange sounding words but if conceptually and that's what we'll do is we'll go through it but we'll not linger on the polysyllabic words we'll just take it by conceptual chunks so people understand what's going on. Uh, was that was that helpful? The analogy of the factory. Yeah, the analogies are are really great. And yeah, in this next part, as practical as you can make it, I think will really help people and kind okay. of ground it in. Absolutely. So what I'll what I'll do is I'll show you a. This is what's called the. Um, this is what's called the ion panel. Now there's a lot of different. Um, mitochondrial tests out there. And There's... just remember too, that there are people who are just listening. So, okay. So I'll just describe, I'll just describe the different pieces then also. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of different mitochondria tests out there. So Genova has three of the major ones. They've got the ion panel, which was the original that Dr. Lord developed in the seventies under Metametrics labs before it was bought out by Genova later on. Uh, in fact, half of all, at least half of all functional tests that we do today in the whole industry were designed by Dr. Lord. And he's kind of he's he's kind of like the unsung hero next to Dr. Bland, Dr. Jeff Bland. Like Dr. Lord is he he's he's the one least people know the least about. 
uh, but we but is the most directly responsible for all of our functional testing. And so what he would do is he would develop these tests and then the other companies would sit and wait to see if it had legs and they do their copies of it. So you have the ion panel, then and Genova bought them out. So there's Genova has the ion panel. It has the Nutravel, which is the which was their version of the ion panel before they bought Metametrics. Then during the uh then over the past three years, they developed a version that didn't require a blood draw. So, so the ion panel and the neutral require a blood draw and a urine collection. So over the past three years, they developed a, a, a version that just required a blood spot, like, like a, like a diabetes blood spot testing. So you didn't have to go to a clinic or have a mobile phlebotomist come to see you. Now that's very convenient, but you get fewer, fewer markers, like, like, like like a chunk fewer. I'm not going to cover that that version, but just if people are either afraid of blood getting their blood drawn, or they don't want to go to a clinic, there is a there is a version of this that you can just do all in the comfort of your own home. Um, and then you've got the OAT test, which stands for the Organic Acid Test by uh, Diagnostic Solutions Lab. You've got um, no, sorry. That's that's by Great Plains. Excuse me. Diagnostic Solutions has the OMX OMX test, which is their version of checking the mitochondria and just the amino acid portion. Um, and, and I'm just sharing these names so that if people are thinking about what is the mitochondria test, here are the names, it's ion, neutral, metabolomics, OAT test, OMX. Those are the major ones. And there's, there's others coming out, but those are the five major ones uh, or just organics or organic acids testing. So what we're looking at here on the ion panel is we're looking first here at the amino acids. Now the amino we're looking at, the, there's 20 main amino acids and there's some other ancillary ones that, that are useful as well, but not as useful as the top 20. And what we want to look for, in the reason why amino acids are so important is they're the building blocks. Like most people know of, say like, oh, tyrosine is, you know, part for thyroid production. Well, the majority of our, our tryptophan is useful for, um, tryptophan is useful for, uh, you know, making serotonin and melatonin well the majority of what these amino acids are doing is for building you build building you like building tissue building cells building a city uh it's 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 concrete it's bricks it's it's all the different things so if you're low it's hard for you to repair so what we're looking for is what is low and what is high so if the amino acids are low you you give them the, the amino acids that they need so if this person's low in threonine uh, then you give them threonine. But what happens if they're high? Like if it's high glycine, then that's an issue. You've got this backlog of some amino acids not being able to get into the cells. Like if it's being delivered, these, these are aminos being delivered to the cities for to help them build and repair. Then you need uh, B6 mostly to help because B6 is the main is, is the main cofactor in order to help the cell use the amino acids. So, so Sam, what do you do if somebody can't tolerate B vitamins? You know, oftentimes B vitamins are grown on some sort of fungal agar. And if somebody has got mold or yeast, sometimes they can't tolerate them. What do you do in that situation? So if they've got, if they've got issues with mold, that, that has to do with ordering. Uh, so if you are, if you have another, um, metabolic issue like mold or yeast, then you may have to address those things first. Um, there are also different types of B vitamins that some people may tolerate. It may be like methylated versus unmethylated. I mean, B12 has four different types as cyanocobalamin, meth uh, methylcobalamin, adenosylcobalamin, and hydroxycobalamin. So there's four different versions there just of B12. Um, and there's, there also may be different delivery systems. So some people, the B vitamins may be causing havoc in their gut for whatever dysbiotic gut permeability issues they got going on. So maybe there's liposomal deliveries where they're absorbed directly through the cheeks and under the tongue. Some people are so sensitive, you have to like, they can take the liposomal, but they shouldn't swallow the residual, they have to spit it out. Or there's even people I've seen have intranasal um, I've seen that with B12, mm -hmm. uh, nasal delivery. Uh, so there, there are other mechanisms to deliver if the issue is intestinal distress that the B vitamins are somehow triggering. 
Um, and and there's also if people are struggling with B vitamins, then then there may be an issue with the multis where they have to like do individuals, individual B vitamins and painstakingly dose painstakingly dose individual ones until they've meet, meet, reached a tolerance point. And that's ta- long and frustrating and difficult. And, you, and it's, it's, it's really best to work with someone who has a lot of experience with that level of difficulty. Um, did that answer your question? You did. Thank you. And another one that's related is that there are some of these protocols that are like very high dose of B vitamins. Mm-hmm. And do you think that some of the success that people are having with that is because they're like forcing the mitochondria to turn on because there's such big cofactors of a lot of these different pathways? So, so if I understand your question, it's like, if you, if people, some protocols that, that, that do a meaningful percentage of the time, do actually help people involve a lot of B vitamins. And you're asking me how, what's the mechanism behind high dose B vitamins that may be able to really help people. Is that what you're asking? Correct. Yeah. Some of the, uh, the thiamine protocols, um, where it's like multiple B1 types and then some other high doses of other B vitamins. Yeah. So when, uh, so uh, Dr. Lord, uh, when Dr. Lord came out of retirement while I was still studying with Kalish and, and he actually asked the question, what's the most important B vitamin of them all? And, and this is, and you have to, and just, just to understand Dr. Lord, he was like, he was in like, I think it was university of Austin. Like where he was getting his PhD where like the people in the same building, like discovered B6, like several of the B vitamins were discovered in the building. He was getting, I think his <laughs> biotin, which is B7. Uh, uh, so, so he, he had, he had some clout to talk about B vitamins, should we say a little bit. So, and no one knew the answer. And he said, B1, B1. So that's thiamine is what you just mentioned. So if someone is so depleted, you need B vitamins to run the show. Like this is why every, every multivitamin, you know, matter, even these crappy Flintstones vitamins that I was, was given as a kid, which is basically like tar and some, some vitamins that are sprinkled in there. Um, you need B vitamins to run the mitochondria and also to run the, the, the emergency burning faculties of burning the garbage and the, the candles in the streets with your mitochondria busted. You need B vitamins for that. So if someone is so depleted and they happen to be taking the a sufficient volume of B vitamins that, that is building up their deficient that is that is making them replete from like however many years of, of depletion then yeah that they can they can feel a lot better now there, there's a there's a trick there's a there's a warning to that if you turn the mitochondria back on very rapidly you are also going to turn on a lot of free radicals you will start you will start generating a lot of sparks and uh, so you, it, so people can have this like massive bump and then they can go, then they can kind of feel like they're going on a down swoop. And that's because now the uh, different problems emerged where you're just sparks are flying everywhere and creating free radical damage. So, so it's, it, it's, it thing, things, it's ideal that you pair things with, um, you know, antioxidants and, and other things to, to help support the mitochondria as it's kicking back on. Uh, yeah. Additionally, your detox mechanisms may may kick back in because suddenly you have electricity to now move the garbage out, and so so then people's detox mechanisms can kick back in, and and B vitamins can also uptick phase one. They really that's what they do. Also, they they uptick phase one detox, and if you don't have enough phase two detox amino acids, here we go, bring it back to amino acids. Look at that. Um, and you need amino acids also to detox like glycine and glutathione is made of three major amino acids, uh, gl- glutamine, glycine, and N-acetylcysteine. Uh, if you are lacking in those amino acids, whether it's methionine, methi- there's methionation, there's glycination, there's glutathionation, there's, there's, there's six major detox pathways that require amino acids, you're going to uh, push toxins harder. And if you don't have amino acids to catch them, you can also get a Hertz reaction, um, a Hertzheimer reaction, because you're, you're detoxing fast and you're able to keep up. Thank you. Um, 
So, so that's amino acids where basically you look for what's low and then you, you give what's low and then you look for what's high and then you can give B vitamins. Now I'm, I'm generalizing. There's a couple exceptions here and there where some things that are measured high, you, it's a sign for more magnesium or some other things, but in general, that's what you're looking for. Now, some people may say, well, I eat a lot of meat. I should be fine. Or I eat lots of rice and beans and whatever. Well, the thing is, this is where gut comes into amino acids, where if people, amino acids are like little Legos that your your cells, like they're, they're tiny individual Legos, but your body can't absorb, you're breaking down this big hunk of protein into tiny individual Lego blocks. That happens in the intestinal lining. So when you're you're chewing food and then the stomach acid breaks it down, there's enzymes that break it down further. It breaks it down into what are called dientripeptides, which are two and three amino acids that are stuck together. It's like three different color Lego pieces that are stuck together in any orientation. And um, my so if you don't have a good the, the last bit of breaking those down into single amino acids is done in the cells that line the intestines. So if you have a leaky gut or an inflamed gut or your your gut or, or some other issues going on, then you cannot absorb proper amino acids. You can't you can't just like I'll take bunches of gelatin and that'll be fine, or I'll eat a lot more meat if you got all these lows. If your gut's messed up you actually can't properly absorb the amino acids across the gut. So this is where you'd want to look at the gut along with the mitochondria. Other things to look at with the labs are you've got homocysteine, which is a really important molecule because uh, it's it's like it, it's kind of a sharp or sticky molecule that affects the blood vessels. It checks for key minerals that affect the mitochondria. Remember even manganese? Remember I said MN sod, Mr. Sod was the head janitor. MN for MN sod stands for manganese. So if you got low manganese, that head janitor, it ain't working well. Uh, this, th and then he checks for certain toxic elements. Now this person right here, she's a smoker. So you see how the cadmium and the mercury are way up. And because, because this is, if you see it in the blood, it's like acute exposure. So this is, I'm having a conversation with her actually next week <laughs> this is fresh off the press i literally got this one today and i was like oh look smoker this should be good to show on the podcast uh so there you go <laughs> cadmium and mercury now eat your heart out all right then it checks for fat soluble vitamins and these these are real important these are these are other antioxidants to support the whole process glutathione i'm sure you've talked about glutathione ad nauseum uh, on your podcast. And this actually measures glutathione. Now, just to catch here, this is checking for oxidized and reduced glutathione, the total amount. This is not telling you if it's the reduced or oxidized form. So if people have globally low glutathione here, then I would want to give them exogenous glutathione, like liposomal glutathione. But I'd also want to check back to see, are do they have enough glycine, N-acetylcysteine, and glutamine to help create their own glutathione because that would low amino acids can affect that. You're also looking at how your damaged fat markers and how much free radical damage is happening to your DNA. And vitamin D is massively important because vitamin D controls up to 5% of your DNA, most of it related to immunity and inflammation. And if you're inflamed, it's going to affect the mitochondria. Then we come to the organic acids, the actual mitochondria itself. And this is where patterns are more important than, um, than particulars. So where, where a lot of practitioners get lost is they fixate on particular markers, and that's a mistake. You want to look for big picture patterns. So if people are running high, like globally high, in all of these markers. And you can see here by category, this is the fatty acid truckers union. This is the carb truckers union. This is the amino acid truckers union. This is the actual mitochondria itself. If these numbers are running high, that means that they're burning through very rapidly. The engine's running hot. The electricity is over, the factory's overworking. And it's like, you're burning through all of your raw materials. So you need to feed lots of the raw materials that that um, go into like B vitamins and and amino acids and magnesium and, and all and CoQ10 and other things. But if it's globally low, 
globally low, that's what's called mitochondrial retraction. That's an actual field that's developed mitochondrial retraction in the past decade and a half or so that's newer in the literature where the mitochondria, it's like the engine starts to melt. So if you have a higher pattern, you give the nutrients. If you have a globally lower pattern, the engine has melted. The factory has melted. You need to rebuild the factory, so which is a different set of protocols to rebuild the factory than merely feeding the factory. And so that that's a that's a that's something Dr. Lord himself discovered, or at least is teaching, uh, that the difference between running hot and the factory melting down. Um, then you've got we mentioned the neurotransmitters, where uh, these are neurotransmitter metabolites, like how well they're what's being used. Um, just to give a conceptual difference. This is a blood and urine test. So blood tells you what fuel is in the pipes. The urine test is the emissions test to tell you what's being used. We have no way to go into a mitochondria, knock on the factory door and with a little audit and clipboards like, hey, how much are you using here and there? That, that's not a thing. What you do is you collect the urine, which is the emissions test. There's certain markers in the urine that are emissions test of the mitochondria to know what's being used. So uh, you can tell how the neurotransmitters are being are being used and that those affect the mitochondria. Then we have toxics, uh, toxic exp um, how well your liver is metabolizing things. So you have markers here for glutathione use. You have markers here for how well you're getting rid of ammonia. Uh, you have uh, you have markers also that check your microbiome. Uh, and yeast and fungal markers, as well as oxalates, which are very, very important because uh, if people have oxalates, it can affect their diet or they're generated by fungal infections. And sometimes, and this is real important, stool tests are not always accurate in identifying fungus. I'll say that again. Stool tests, whether it's GI map, GI effects, GI 360, or CDCs, they are not optimized to capture yeast for two reasons. One, the preservatives are not optimized to preserve the yeast. They're optimized to preserve parasites, protozoa, bad bacteria, and so on. But also yeast is usually in the small intestine and you're collecting a large distal large intestine sample. So the yeast could die off by the time it gets to the large intestine. And so when you see the D arabinitol marker in, in the, cause I've seen this over and over again, where the, the GI map is like normal or meh yeast levels, but the D arabinitol marker is very high. That shows there's a systemic fungal thing going on that is not being picked up in the stool sample. So sometimes the, the, the mitochondria test is the more accurate, well, not sometimes, it is the more accurate test, I feel, if there's systemic fungal issue going on, uh, which is another, who knew you in mitochondria test will also tell you about yeast infections. Um, and then lastly, uh, I, I wanna just, again, just emphasize that the th mitochondria is downstream of the thyroid. And when you're talking about, you have an energy, I mean, you're, you're, you have an energy podcast. You talk about the thyroid a lot and you cannot, I repeat, you cannot separate thyroid from mitochondria. That is not a thing. They are not separate. They talk to each other. They are paired. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just really want to emphasize that the thyroid and mitochondria are paired. There are other things that influence thyroid, like, like iron and other nutrient deficiencies. Adrenals can affect the thyroid. Too much estrogen dominance can affect the thyroid. You know, gut permeability can, create, can trigger the immune response that then create antibodies that attack the thyroid. So there's other things that can affect thyroid. I, I fully acknowledge and appreciate that. But, you, but, but mitochondria and thyroid are paired. So that's that's the overview of mitochondrial testing. And with mitochondria testing, there are other tests that are best to done with mitochondria, like thyroid, like gut. You'd want to check adrenals, you know, and, and we talked about genetics briefly. Like if you've got a weak, if you've got a variation in your free radical scavenging genes like MNSOD, then you need to do things specifically based on your unique genetics to prop up the expression and to help Mr. Saad, you know, mobilize that, that he needs extra support because genetically you're, you're, you're in a rougher situation. Like, like me, I've got a red dot in my MN Saad. So, and, and my GPX. So I've, I have a very difficult time generically dealing with free radicals, but I do a lot of the stuff that I need to based on my genetics to keep my mitochondria healthy based on my genetics. 
and I also do the the functional mitochondria test. So that's that is a very rapid pace uh, overview of mitochondrial testing. And I want to um, just want to pause there and just like let let the mitochondrial chips land. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. I really appreciate that. Uh, we've just got uh, a, a couple minutes left. And so where can people go, find you, learn more about you? And then if you just want to share a little bit about your free gift with us. Sure. So I've got uh, people who just go to my website, um, drsamshay.com, D-R-S-A-M-S-H-A-Y.com. Sometimes you may need just to put H-T-T-P-S colon forward slash forward slash drsamshay.com. So uh, there's and there you'll find uh, uh, one or more of my free eBooks. One is on uh, biohacking, uh, which is covers more on functional tests in and my model for health called the 10 Pillars of Health. I have other eBooks on there on how to genetically optimize your diet and how to gene and on genetics, way more detail in genetics. And if people are interested in my um, my comedy, they can just go to YouTube, put in Dr. Sam Shea. And I have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe. And there's a playlist that's stand up comedy. And then there's other playlists of all all sorts of other functional uh, medicine talks I've done on podcasts and some. I mean, we, me and Evan, you and I did one I think a year ago on the genetics of diet. Uh, and uh, also, and just uh, and, and I'm also have a, uh, a helpful newsletter that covers all sorts of topics related to natural health and uh, functional testing. Excellent. And we'll drop the links below. So appreciate this explanation today. And, you know, big picture for folks is that, you know, if this was a little bit overwhelming for you, just know that, that Dr. Sam is going to explain it all to you when you're, when you're working with him and he's going to give you a plan that's going to be uh, really clear and, um, and concise. So thanks so much for being with us today, Dr. Sam, and I'll see you soon. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate you having us. I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have is one of my absolute favorite things to do. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Thanks for listening and have an amazing day.